Good morning. Um, I'm going to speak with you this morning about the role of Article 43.3 in medical and parental decision making. When it comes to medical decision making, there is a potential for a tension between the rights of a pregnant woman and the right to life of the unborn. At the outset, I'd emphasize two preliminary points. Firstly, that although Article 40.3.3 is most commonly discussed in the context of abortion, it's important to recognize that the wording of the article is actually very general. Rather than establishing a constitutional prohibition on abortion per se, the article establishes a constitutional recognition of the right to life of the unborn. And because the article is phrased in this way, it has implications beyond the concept of abortion. The second preliminary point I'd make is that the unborn may enjoy rights other than the right to life. For example, the case law has mentioned the right to bodily integrity or the right to personal dignity. However, it's very difficult to see how the courts will proceed in balancing those rights of the fetus other than life against the mother's rights. I would say in this regard that the Attorney General and X case does not apply to situations in which a balance is to be drawn between the rights of the woman and the rights of the fetus other than life. So to consider, for example, the position of a woman who decides to use heroin during her pregnancy. In this instance, while there may be no risk to the life of the fetus, there could be a risk that the child, if born alive, will have developmental problems and that their health could be affected in quite a significant way. In a case such as this, where there's a conflict therefore between the right of the woman to autonomy and privacy and the right of the fetus to bodily integrity. Neither Article 40.3.3 nor the X case would appear to govern the result of this particular conflict. I want to speak with you briefly now about the right to refuse treatment medical treatment in general terms. And I would make a few introductory remarks in relation to that. The right to refuse medical treatment is a very important right as a matter of medical ethics and as a matter of law. It is protected in Ireland under the common law and also protected by the Constitution. The Medical Council's Guide to Professional Conduct and Ethics emphasizes that every adult with capacity is entitled to refuse medical treatment and that a doctor must respect their patient's wishes even if they don't agree with them. <coughs> Furthermore, the national consent policy provides that if an adult with capacity makes an informed decision, this decision must be respected even if it could result in the service user's death. There are some limitations on the right to refuse medical treatment that have been contemplated by the courts. For example, in the case reaward of court withholding of medical treatment, Judge Denham postulated that the right could be infringed in the cases of contagious diseases, medical emergencies, or perhaps where the patient was unable to communicate. It is important though to emphasize that the right to refuse treatment includes the right to refuse life-saving treatment. And this has recently been recognized in the context of a prisoner on hunger strike. And of course, it's also important to remember that the right to refuse treatment extends to the right to take decisions which might be viewed as objectively irrational. So I want to talk for a moment about issues that arise in relation to the refusal of treatment, medical treatment, during pregnancy. So the question which arises 
is whether Article 40.3.3 means that a woman's right to refuse treatment is limited during pregnancy, where the treatment may be necessary to protect the unborn. At the outset, it's important to distinguish between two separate circumstances. The first is where the treatment is necessary to protect the life of the unborn, and the second is where the treatment is necessary to protect the health, but not the life of the unborn. Now, it's not at all clear that Article 40.3.3 has any application in a case for restricting the woman's right to refuse treatment by reference to the need to protect the health of the unborn. This is because Article 40.3.3 mentions only the life of the unborn, and also because of the very high constitutional status placed upon the right to refuse treatment. By contrast, however, it is arguable that if treatment is necessary to safeguard the right to life of a fetus, then Article 40.3.3 might require that treatment be provided in the absence of a woman's consent. HSE and B provides an example of how these issues might play out in practice. So, in the case of HSE and B, the High Court considered an application by the HSE for an order forcing a pregnant woman to have a caesarean section against her will in order to vindicate the right to life of her unborn child. Now, the medical evidence provided by the HSE was that if she tried to deliver the baby naturally, there was a real risk of uterine rupture, which could lead to the death of the baby and the death of Mrs. B. In fact, the risk of uterine rupture was estimated as one in 10. Therefore, Mrs. B was strongly medically advised that she should have an elective cesarean section rather than attempting a natural delivery. In the course of the judgment, the court stated that it couldn't understand why Mrs. B would want to take such an unnecessary risk. However, the court accepted that its role was not to say whether it agreed or disagreed with Mrs. B's decision, but rather to decide whether she could be forced against her will to submit to a surgical procedure in the interests of her unborn child. The court acknowledged that if she were not pregnant, it would be a gross violation of her rights to forcibly restrain her and subject her to a surgical procedure to which she did not consent. Ultimately, the court decided to refuse the requested order for a caesarean section. In so doing, the court adopted the test for state intervention, which applies in relation to parental decision making. Effectively, what the court said is that even in respect of a decision which can put at risk the health or life of a child, the courts would be very slow to intervene and that this would only occur in exceptional circumstances. The court said that therefore, as the right of the courts to intervene could not be any higher in the case of an unborn child, than in the case of a born child, the sufficiently exceptional circumstances which might justify interference did not exist in the case. It is important to emphasize though, that in the HSE and B case, the medical evidence indicated that it was by no means a certainty that the fetus's life would be endangered by a natural delivery although it was accepted that it carried significant risks. It does remain possible, therefore, that in a subsequent case, a court could take the view that Article, Article 40.3.3 requires compulsory caesarean section, especially if there is a higher degree of risk to the unborn. I'd like to address you briefly on maternal brain death. In general medical terminology, the death of a person is equated with the death of the brain. We say someone is dead when, we, when they are brain dead. 
and a person may be brain dead but nonetheless maintained on a ventilator. Now, the case of PP and HSE deserves some attention. In that case, the High Court had to consider the case of a woman who'd suffered a brain injury during pregnancy. She died on a ventilator and was diagnosed as brain dead. The fetus was approximately 15 weeks gestation and still had a heartbeat. It was accepted that the absolute limit for fetal viability was about 22 weeks, but that a fetus born alive even at that stage would have very significant long-term disabilities. The court considered an application by the patient's father. The patient's family wished that life support could be discontinued. And the court had to consider whether or not this was permissible. In that particular case, the evidence of the doctors before the court was that the prospect of a successful delivery, even if life support was continued, was virtually nil, and that therefore it would be futile to continue with the life support. Therefore, the order was not granted, because the court felt it was in both the best interests of the unborn and in the best interests of the woman to allow her to die and to allow the fetus to die as well. However, it's important to emphasize that this is because there was no reasonable possibility that the baby would be born alive, even if life support was continued. In the course of the judgment, the court had to consider whether or not the patient, as a dead person, continued to enjoy constitutional rights. The court held that she did continue to enjoy the right to dignity and proper respect for her autonomy, and that due regard had to be had to the grief and sorrow of her family. However, the court also found that all of these rights were subordinated to the right of the fetus to life. The result of this case seems to be that in a future case, if a fetus is viable, an argument could be made that treatment should be maintained. This might cause difficulties in cases where continued life support would be strongly opposed by the family. I want to look now at the issue of a pregnant woman's right to elect to undergo treatment. And by this I mean treatment which is medically indicated for the woman but may have a detrimental effect on the fetus. And a well-known example in this respect would be where a woman was suffering from cancer and required chemotherapy, which might constitute life-saving treatment for the mother, but could pose a risk to the life of the fetus. On the wording of Article 40.3.3, it is arguable that the state would be required to protect the life of the fetus if the woman's election of treatment resulted in a threat to that life. <coughs> in principle, it would seem that this particular situation is capable of triggering the test set out in the X case. As you'll recall, the test set out in the X case was that if it is established as a matter of probability that there's a real and substantial risk to the life as distinct from the health of a mother, which can only be avoided by termination, then such termination is permissible. The same reasoning would seem to apply to medical treatment, one effect of which may be to terminate the pregnancy, where there's a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother if she does not undergo the relevant treatment. In this regard, I would also like to draw your attention briefly to the Protection of Life in Pregnancy Act 2013, which I know has already been the subject of other papers. Just to emphasize briefly that the purpose of this act was to codify the balance to be struck between the right to life of the mother and the right to life of the unborn, as set down in the X case. Now, the 2013 Act is drafted in broad terms 
and extends beyond a situation in which a woman simply makes a request for an abortion on the basis of a real and substantial risk to her life. Because of the way in which the act is worded, it appears to apply to procedures which could have the result of ending the life of the fetus or procedures in the course of which the life of the fetus might be ended rather than merely to procedures which have as their purpose the termination of the life of the fetus. It seems therefore that the 2013 Act may well apply to the chemotherapy example that I've outlined above. Now, as you're aware, the effect of the 2013 Act is to allow such a medical procedure to proceed where there's a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother and this is certified by two medical practitioners or three medical practitioners if the risk to the life is posed by the risk of suicide. The 2013 Act though does refer to the need to preserve the unborn life as, soon, as far as practicable and this raises two separate possibilities. Firstly, that where life-saving treatment is required by the mother, the decision may be made instead to opt for early delivery of the fetus or baby if that's possible. The second possibility is that it might be argued that a doctor would be required to consider the possibility of delaying treatment until the end of the pregnancy, even if this might have a consequential detrimental effect on the health of the woman. I'll make a few remarks now in relation to capacity to consent to medical treatment and access to abortion by people who lack capacity and by minors. Now, historically the law in this country took a status-based approach to capacity. That meant that a person's legal capacity was de defined by reference to the category to, whom the person, to which the person belonged. So if a person had a mental disability, they were therefore held to be legally incompetent to make decisions about their own treatment. Today, however, the law favours a functional approach to capacity. And by that I mean that the assessment of capacity is made by reference to a person's ability to make a specific medical decision at a specific time. So, for example, even though a person might have dementia, they may be able to fully understand a particular medical decision and make a reasoned decision for themselves, and this decision would be respected. <coughs> this test of functional capacity was recognised by Judge Lefoy in the High Court in the case of Fitzpatrick and FK. Now, under the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act of 2015, decisions in respect of people who lack capacity are generally made on the basis of that person's will and preferences, beliefs and values. In the case of a pregnant woman who loses capacity, treatment decisions are made by the medical practitioner acting on that basis. A medical practitioner is required in this regard to consider the best interests of the woman in the absence of the best interests of the fetus and the best interests of the woman. I'd like to touch briefly on the capacity of minors. It is thought and likely that children or minors over the age of 16 may be legally competent to consent to a medical procedure which would lead to the death of a fetus, subject, of course, to satisfying the conditions laid out in the 2013 Act. Children under the age of 16 are in a different position. They do not enjoy any statutory right to consent to treatment. And the decision will be those of their parents. Now, in the United Kingdom, there is a line of case law to the effect that if a minor is sufficiently mature, they may enjoy a right to consent to treatment. That line of authority has not been followed yet or considered yet in this jurisdiction. And it is important in this regard to acknowledge that there is a distinction between Ireland and the UK in that the Irish constitution strongly protects the rights of parents to make decisions regarding their children. Now, 
If a child is in long-term state care, the rights of the parent to consent or refuse to medical treatment are enjoyed by the state, which is in loco parentis. This was recently considered in a case A and B and the Eastern Health Board. That case concerned a child who was pregnant as a result of rape and who was in state care. She wished to go to England to obtain an abortion. Her natural parents originally supported the decision, but then sought an order, but then became opposed to the decision. Ultimately, the health board sought an order that would permit the child to go to England to undergo an abortion. The court, in looking at this issue, decided that it did not have jurisdiction to permit a woman to travel to another country to obtain an abortion that would not be legal in Ireland. Instead, the court said that the X case merely prevents injunctions being granted to prevent such persons traveling, but doesn't confer a positive right to travel. In this particular case, the court held that the criteria set out in the X case for abortion were satisfied in any event because there was a risk of suicide which posed a real and substantial risk to the child's life. <coughs> Notably, this decision appears to have been made on the basis of the evidence of one psychiatrist. And on the basis of the 2013 Act, more evidence would be required for that same decision to be reached. I would like to close by offering you one remark in relation to the possibility of father's rights in the context of abortion. Article 40.3.3 makes no mention whatsoever of the father of the unborn. There doesn't appear to be any case law to suggest that the father may have any specific rights in relation to abortion. And furthermore, Article 40.3.3 preserves the mother's right to travel and doesn't say that it is limited in any way by the previous article. It might be argued, therefore, that this suggests that a father would have no entitlement to prevent a woman traveling abro abroad to obtain an abortion. On the other hand, however, it is likely that a father would be in a position to take proceedings and to access the courts to seek to protect the fetus from an unlawful threat, such as an illegal abortion. However, in those circumstances, the father would be accessing the courts to protect the right to life of the fetus, not necessarily to protect his own rights. I'd like to just close by referring to the fact that the cases that I've outlined to you do breathe some life into the bare bones of the legal principles. However, they have to be looked at with some caution. Many of these cases were decided in the context of emergencies where legal argument and the court judgments were completed very quickly. In addition to that, the fact that many of these cases were not appealed <coughs> past high court level does somewhat li limit their precedential value. So in many respects, we are still in unchartered seas. Thank you. Thank you.